recent surge in COVID-19 cases in Gauteng has seen the province pass the 100,000 mark. That's in cases counted since March. That's when South Africa's outbreak began. So Gauteng then becomes the epicenter of the country as far as provinces are concerned, exceeding the Western Cape, which had until now been the biggest area of concern for health officials. Joining us to talk more about this, the surge in particular and other issues around the national lockdown is epidemiologist Professor Alex Broadbent from the Institute for the Future of Knowledge. Alex, a very good afternoon to you. Thank you so much for being with us. So when you look at some of the measures announced by the ministers and the MEC in Gauteng, do you get the sense that government is moving fast enough to stay ahead of the worst in Gauteng? I think at this stage it's extremely difficult to stay ahead. Uh, if you look at the way the disease has progressed through the population, it doesn't appear that either locking down or unlocking has actually changed the reproduction number at all. It's a dead straight line on a logarithmic scale. So it's not clear to me that there's anything uh, really that's going to be changed as a consequence of the, in terms of the transmission. I think what the latest regulations are really doing is trying to alleviate burden on the healthcare system. And obviously that is a sensible thing to try to do in the current situation because we're pretty much at capacity. And the thing, of course, with COVID-19 is, yes, Gauteng has accumulated over 100,000 cases to date. Fairly low, in fact, comparatively low death rate. About 644 people have so far died in the province in COVID-19 related cases. The minister speaking yesterday was saying that that's cause for hope in South Africa, it's good news. Do you expect that the death rate, the mortality rate in the country will also peak with the surge? Uh, well, the death rate will follow a few days behind. I would suppose it's going to be less than it was in, in Europe because the population is considerably younger. Half of our population is 27 or under. Um, I think that the, the other thing to note is that the, re, the, the doubling rate here is much lower than it was in Europe. It's something around 14 days, 12 to 14 days, whereas in Europe it was three or even less than one day in Italy. So it's going slower, and that's also helpful as well in terms of the healthcare system coping. Um, it's also interesting that although we are um, actually fifth globally for active cases and about ninth or tenth for cumulative cases, um, we're something closer to 23rd or so in terms of, uh, uh, sorry, uh, in terms of deaths. So we, we're, we're much lower down. Um, uh, I th actually, I think maybe some close to 53rd in terms of deaths. But we're, as, as you go up the uh, scale of seriousness, um, uh, we, are, we are less, uh, we, we move down that ranking. So while it is clearly true that we're experiencing a lot, I suspect that there is an element of hope and that the population may not be as vulnerable, at least as far as age is concerned. Of course, there are other um, comorbidities that are important, particularly, um, obviously, malnutrition, uh, which is uh, becoming a problem now, I think. And government, of course, in the response is counting on the nine provinces peaking at different times. When you look at how altogether all these provinces are now accumulating or finding more cases of COVID-19, because that's what's really going on at this stage, do you get a sense that there'll be enough time between the peaks to make sure that things aren't completely bad at the same time? Well, if the uh, National Modelling uh, Consortium is correct, which it so far has been about its predictions, and is correct about the number of intensive care beds available, then I'm afraid not, because the number of intensive care beds, it says, that are available are between three and 4,000, and the peak demand is predicted at something uh, between about 25 and 35,000. So. If that's correct, then we could actually be very short of ICU beds. Um, however, it's not clear to me that I mean, it's possible, although they haven't really been very open about it, that the government has considerably increased the uh, uh, capacity of the healthcare system. But to be frank, no, I don't think uh, the healthcare system is going to cope. It would have been remarkable, really, if it would have coped, given that it wasn't coping already prior to this. Uh, I mean, it, healthcare is as much about administration as it is about the number of doctors and the administration, obviously, of the public hospitals is very poor and there aren't enough doctors. So, no, I, I don't think the system is going to cope and I think it's going to be quite difficult. Interesting you should say that because I was listening to Health Minister Zuelin Kiza on the radio this morning and he was saying so far they've built up bed capacity of over 27,000. The issue now is making sure that there's oxygen capacity to match those beds, 12,000 right. more beds he's expecting will arrive in the coming weeks. When you look at that yeah. process, just where oxygen is concerned, it's crucial to the treatment of COVID-19 patients, but is there enough to yes. go around? 
So that's the issue. I mean, you can, I've seen these pictures of wards full of beds. I mean, that really doesn't mean much. I mean, beds are great, but you can also lie on the ground and get medical care. The, the question is what the actual medical care is you're getting. And uh, what's needed, uh, what's the real question is how much um, uh, intensive care there is available. And the shortfall there is appeared to be something between 20 and 30,000. I, I don't know whether if you count in some high care and some critical care beds as well, that, that changes it a bit. But it's still in the order of, you know, maybe tens of thousands, which is and it's just although it's very quick and easy to stick a load of beds in an empty, empty building, it's a different matter to set up an intensive care ward. And what defines an intensive care ward is mechanical ventilation. And um, we, we don't, you know, we, we, I don't think, I ha certainly the, there hasn't been, whatever ministers say, there hasn't been reliable data being released to researchers about the actual healthcare capacity increases. The data is very um, uh, hard to get hold of. So it's very hard for me to assess, but the, um, but the situation doesn't, uh, it doesn't actually appear to be mm. very... Uh, very positive. At the start of this pandemic, we're told about this rush for resources, be it PPE, beds, and the rest of it. So the oxygen challenge then globally, is it a fairly easy thing to acquire at this point, given that we are going into the surge? Well, uh, it depends who is trying to do the acquiring. As I say, a lot of this, a lot of running healthcare systems and indeed responding to epidemics is about organization. And this is not a very you know, our healthcare system is not very organized. We haven't managed to get a large, you know, anything like an adequate capacity in our healthcare system in the last 25 years. So I highly doubt we'll do it now. Um, uh, and there wasn't much done as far as anybody could tell during the hard lockdown by way of preparing the, the, the healthcare the capacity. I mean, if a minister wants to come on and actually uh, uh, make some data available, that'd be great. They can always come on and say what they want. But as I say, data on this just hasn't been available um, and that suggests that nothing really has been done. Final question then, I want to get your take on the issue of the taxis. On Sunday, the president said in, taxis traveling across provinces would load at 70% capacity. That was the initial regulation for taxis at the start of the lockdown. But now, local taxis will be allowed to load at full capacity, provided, of course, that everyone is wearing a mask, that there's proper sanitization, and that these vehicles travel with some of the windows open as someone who works in healthcare and science does that sound to you like a safe thing to do i think it's a necessary thing to do i certainly would not advocate hard lockdown at this stage um people have to live and i and i've said this throughout i don't think hard lockdown was ever a good idea uh you can't see any evidence that it made any difference as i say it's a dead straight line uh, whatever people say it started off steep and then it's a dead straight line um, I think also the whole idea of regulation is wrong. What should have been done and what should be done now is that the government needs to actually consult and ask people if they've get, got any bright ideas. Because people know how they live. They know what risks they, they experience. They know how to balance those risks. They know whether they care more about starving uh, or risking or running some risk. I mean, you, you run some risk if you step into a taxi, regardless of whether COVID-19 is out there. So, you know, it's an additional risk on top of that. Um, what you need to do is consult people on what, what the balance of risks they're willing to take is and whether they've got any bright ideas. I think the whole, the whole idea of um, this top-down approach um, is probably missing details about people's lives that leaders living uh, on the other side of a very large chasm couldn't possibly know. All right, Professor Alex Broadbent, thank you so much for your time. He is an epidemiologist speaking to us this afternoon about the expected rise, the peak here in Gauteng in those COVID-19 infections. The province now has over 100,000 cases recorded since March. That's COVID-19 cases.